You guys wanted to see a full review of the new Hyundai Santa Fe. And here it is. They do not split anymore between Santa Fe Sport and Santa Fe, or in, that's for the US, or in Europe, Santa Fe and Grand Santa Fe. There is now one new Santa Fe model. It still offers the seven-seater option. Sometimes now, depending on the market, it's called a Hyundai Phase 7, if it's a seven-seater option, but it's just one length for this model. And we'll take you on a detailed tour, an exterior and interior, and the driving experience here on Autogo Fuel with Thomas in full HD, full screen, and full length. Let's go. Oh, by the way, if some of you now thought, wait a minute, in the US configurator I just saw a Hyundai Santa Fe XL, what's that? Yeah, that's the old big model, but not the new one, so they keep it for a while. But ultimately, the successor of the bigger one will be the Hyundai Palisade, which is then the big SUV, together with the same platform as the Kia Telluride. AJ has shown you that one in Detroit. Here in the front of the new Hyundai Santa Fe, we can see a bigger, more modern front grille. Also leads over to those headlamps. They optionally come with LED, also with a nice LED daytime running light. So this is a very friendly face, but more modern than before. The color we show you here is magma red. The length is at 4 meters 77, 188 inches or 15 foot 6. And what I've done is putting the smaller Hyundai Santa Fe model a little bit bigger, so they don't need two separate models anymore. And then the bigger one will be the Hyundai Palisade for the very, very large SUV model. Well, chrome frames around the window, they raised a little bit in the rear to make it a little bit more agile, but they made the rear window line a little bit bigger overall, so you have more light on the interior here however with the dark feature but so that the rear passengers can also better look to the outside we have 19 inch right there for the wheels they still look a little bit balloonish because those are winter tires will look sportier when you have summer tires mounted and you still have those crossover wheel arches right there to still get somewhat of an suv look well it's rather conservative as for the side profile but i think it's a simple design and also has some elegance well what do you think Design-wise, this is probably the biggest change if you compare it to the predecessor generation because the rear definitely looks more modern with those horizontally drawn tail lamps. So the rear of the predecessor looked a little bit more bulky. That one here, a little bit more elegance and sportiness, so to say, if we talk about that in this segment. H-Track, by the way, this badge is their all-wheel drive brand. It's front-wheel drive plus all-wheel drive on demand. And this naturally aspirated petrol engine also has a real exhaust pipe, one right there. By the way, also quite funny when some people watch me here doing the reviews and, oh, he's obviously selling his car. Well, I'm not really selling vehicles, I'm just reviewing them. <laughs> but funny what people think when other people start filming cars. Well, not everyone wants to sell the car when they're filming. It was two people, right? Whatever. Cool, they have hydraulic struts for this engine bay. So, a lot of room here still, we can see. This is a 2.4 liter naturally aspirated petrol engine, 185 horsepower, six speed automatic gearbox, 10.4 seconds acceleration to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. Test consumption here, I can already tell you, is about 8.5 liters and more kilometers for today. So 28 MPG or 33 MPG UK for this one here. And then also available there is a 2 liter diesel, 150 horsepower and a 2.2 liter diesel with 200 horsepower. The small diesel just front wheel drive, the bigger diesel front wheel drive or all wheel drive. Here our petrol for the day, always all wheel drive.
inside of the doors here soft touch at the top part memory seating if you like that option it's quite helpful then quite sculptural right here that it closes well off with this side when the door is closed soft touch also with this part then you have completely new steering wheel which looks more modern it's also taking over from the smaller Hyundai models and everything is well organized in this interior and the build quality is a little bit better than before those ones on the optional animal skin seats however I could not get exact information but a lot of parts are leather red and others are animal origin that's my research so far but I could not go into very specifics there it's hard to get the information on that the base seats are fabric however and recommend those also for practical reasons because they don't get that hot in summer especially those ones here they do then you need the seat cooling with fabric seats not necessarily so this is the first look at the interior let's test it so let's hop inside the inside here stays quite clean because the lower door sill with this rubber is very low on the outside of the door so that's a good idea seating position is upright and comfortable as you would expect it from a suv i'm one minus 86 or six with one and that leaves quite some headroom right there that's cool also with a very beautiful gray fabric ceiling this is one of my favorite parts of the interior right here the steering wheel can be adjusted in height and reach. It's a very nice and smooth function like that. Also with the electric seats, especially with the memory support, that helps you pretty much to find a good position and also save it. The electric motors that are being used, however, are quite loud. I mean, if that is a detail that plays any major role to you. So I think you can find a very good seating position here. You don't have the highest position, however, it is upright, but if you consider it how high the dashboard is, you don't feel like you would have this command driving position, rather if you prefer it when you're not sitting too high on the road. That's a matter of preference. Here the interior overview with the upgrade material quality. Here, for example, soft touch on the dashboard and look how smooth the materials are here. This is beautifully done, this whole area right there with some cubby hole there as well. That me turn on the instruments and stuff so yeah a lot of beeping sounds here always with those Hyundai's and Kia's then a metal nerding around the knob right here for the climbing control that's good quality and I really like that so no more cheap rubber stuff or something easy to access for example the steering wheel heating or also the seat heating I like that this is just you know simple and straightforward seat cooling here but you cannot use seat cooling and seat heating at the very same time there's a new 8 inch screen available here also with the GPS function however it's not possible with the zoom and pinch here easily I'm not sure why they haven't done that yet um, so it's really strange if you want to browse inside this map other than that what's important if you go here for the main menu you can access the Apple CarPlay this uh, helps pretty much also android auto connection is available then the steering wheel cruise control on the right side left side for example for the volume or for picking up the phone and there are new digital instruments in the middle some analog parts and left out the right and very important to me is the head-up display i could very very well see that crystal clear layout is also one great option they added right here and I would definitely go for it here once more close up to the infotainment system when you are in the Apple CarPlay you can also go back to the main screen right there this one would be then the main menu right here I see Android Auto is grayed out because obviously I don't have an Android system connected to that and you still have a manual knob here for the volume control again with a metal knurling that's also what i meant about the increased build quality that's pretty cool and what i like that when you are in this map view you can access right here you can at least zoom in and out with this knob that's helpful while driving even better than with pinch and zoom you know it's good to have then because when driving you shake a little bit then it's easier to use this control knob and let me show you the rear view camera we can also put it in when the car is not running good to have also this drone view from above you can also change the views to a full rear view camera to the sides right there this is the top 
camera system you can pick. The resolution of the camera could, however, be a little bit better. Left next to the steering wheel, you can activate or deactivate some assistance systems like the blind spot monitor or the lane keeping assist. We'll talk about that one when we drive the car very soon. In the lower part then, you connect your phone via USB for the smartphone connection. Also 12 volt power supply available, but also another USB supply if you like. And this lower area is also an inductive charging area, so that would also be possible. But when you connect for the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, you will use the Kenwood cable anyway. Well done, cup holders here, adaptive in the middle part, electric handbrake, here change the driving modes, hill descent control is also possible. And the last one here is a button for the front view camera, because rear view camera is always active when you put it in reverse gear. But here, if you're parking into the front, it's good to have a separate button to activate the front camera. Nice idea. And this armrest here, the surface is nice with the leather red, but then the shake test is not really, you know, a little bit shaky right there. But then there's a lot of room on the interior, a split. You can put out the upper part and then, well, you can store a lot of things there. Southeast direction at the moment, we see that in the rear mirror. And then what's also pretty cool is this shade in the front windscreen. So sometimes you don't even have to fold down the sunshade because this coloring of the windscreen already helps. And also interesting, this upper part where you store your glasses, the inside part here is very, very soft. Again, pay attention to the quality details. It's one of the things I like best with this new generation, that they really massively increase the build quality. And for some, it might also be interesting to know that this mirror in the sunshade is really very large. Together with a small top light, you can activate yourself. Also, the co-driver seat features a top tether right here for an additional child seat at the front seat. And then also an interesting function, you can control this front seat also from the driver's side, for example, um, that you can you know, slide a little bit more forward or so. That's really helpful. You say like, you know, children say, oh, you know, sitting here, need some more room or something, or for whatever reason you need it. With this vehicle, it of course gets really interesting with the rear door and see here, they open quite wide. That's cool also for parents who can easily access the child seats then, isofix here at the outside seats. Again, not exactly 90 degrees, but enough room. There's also a manual shade here, sunshade for the doors available. Optional also seat heating for the rear seats. So, and then even when I'm sitting in the front as tall driver, still a lot of knee room left and a lot of headroom. So this is the big strength of this vehicle. You have a lot of room in the rear. That's cool. And you're also flexible if you want a bigger trunk. Um, maybe put a child seat here, push it a little bit forward, and then you can see you can vary this bench pretty much in length and also in the angle, because if you want to sit a little bit more upright or it goes very far back there, if you rather prefer a sleeping position, so you're flexible as for that. And when you use the very same lever to put the seats all down, then you can see that the lower area also moved downwards a little bit together. And that then later ensures a flat loading area from the rear. And we will soon take a look at that. And pretty cool, you can fold them all up. Two more USB supplies in the rear and a 220 volt supply also for maybe recharging laptops or cooling box or something else. Electric hatch, let's open it right here. And very interesting, the length here is almost one meter and 10 of the trunk. And then if you look at this, right to left, it's a round cut here of the wheel arches, very interesting. And if we measure the width right there, <laughs> it's hard to get it inside, but then it's almost one meter and 30 here in width and then just here between those wheel arches, it's a little bit more than a meter, that's normal. But the width right here is extraordinary. This one here is an additional floor cover, by the way. You can take it out, for example, for cleaning purposes. And then let me put also some luggage inside. There you can see how much trunk space you have left there, actually. That's pretty cool. Also in height, about 80 centimeters in height. You can also get a cover here. Let's show you that because 
There are some hidden spots in this vehicle right there since this one here is the five seater so here you have this cover you can install and then if you have the five seater you can remove this one and then you have some storage space here underneath um, for whatever you want to use it actually quite roomy inside there and that this would be the place where the six and the seventh seat are being stored and here those seats we can flip them from the rear but there are also buttons here to let them flip from here pretty cool and easy system i really like this option and then we go with the total length is about two meters here to the front seats and you can even go for about two meters 50 if you carry it all through the middle tunnel Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge here with the Hyundai Santa Fe in this new generation and we start with a small motorway piece here and the first thing we notice is it's not really that quiet in here so to me they didn't work enough on the upgrade on the on the noise insulation I mean we're driving 90 kilometers now at the moment so that's not that not that fast so that should be a little bit better we're driving the 2.4 liter naturally aspirated petrol engine and see how you know what that is all about and of course we also take a look at the assistance systems for example there's a blind spot monitor there we go so at least when we activate it so in the next so what strange it was deactivated here you can deactivate or activate the assistance systems here at the left side of the steering column there we go when the next car is approaching from behind there's the blind spot monitor the lane keeping assist is also active at the moment and to me it's sometimes a little bit nervous you know you see it, it keeps you in the lane you should not keep you should not <laughs> you should not give get your hands off the steering wheel you should keep your hands at the steering wheel that's very important it's not uh, meant to be a full autonomous system um, but sometimes it you know, gives me a little bit nervous feeling here in the steering. However, it can be good, for example, for very long highway turns. If you're maybe driving more agile, you can always deactivate it here left next to the steering wheel and then it's gone. Then you can steer yourself freely. What I really found very cool is this new head-up display that is available because I'm always keeping the speed now in the line of sight and it's very clear and crisp to read. That's pretty cool and also adds to safety because I won't look down to the instruments right there. Just look way up ahead there. So this new generation, of course we talked about it in the interior, it feels a little bit more refined because the interior build quality has been stepped up just a little bit. I have to say I still remember quite well how the old generation was driving and I have to say it's really not the biggest of the difference. So yes, we have a fresh new exterior and we also have some more fancy interior stuff. Everything is very well organized, easy to use, new infotainment system upgrade. But driving wise, I don't feel it would be the biggest difference. So again, I would have expected a little bit more as for noise insulation that they worked on that a little bit more. It feels maybe a little bit more agile to drive. We'll soon drive a little bit faster and also do some roundabout and we can um, get onto that again. But if we compare it, for example, to the competitors, especially in, in Europe, that would be from those Volkswagen corporation models. So the VW Tiguan Allspace, the Škoda Kodiak and the Seat Taraco. Those three, which are the technology side, basically all the same vehicles, they feel more agile to drive that is one of the biggest difference they're almost you know approximately the same size however this one here at some point can be a better price performance deal especially in the us in europe it's not that cheap this model but in the us talked about it earlier very great great prices for this vehicle um, that's why it's also uh, so common the suspension is not something i'm very fond of so it is 
first of all rather soft but then again if you running through those potholes and this part of the um, of the street here is actually very good to test it always with the vehicles and therefore I'm always repeating that because the road is not that good here it's got some you know like um, some let's say uh, asphalt ruts in it sometimes some pot potholes and so on and the suspension is not reacting very well to that so overall the driving feeling you get from this vehicle let's say it's rather loose so the suspension is soft but not forgiving in potholes you don't have the feeling that you could steer the car very precisely you somehow feel a little bit disconnected from the vehicle it's maybe not the most important thing for this very segment since this is mainly let's say a family carrier and you need a lot of luggage in there and you're also quite flexible we've shown you that in the interior part but I have expect from the new generation actually a little bit more as for the driving experience also considering that the other Hyundai and Kia models from this corporation they have been massively upgraded also in the driving feeling recently let's think about the new Kia seat which was very well to drive but especially suspension wise Mm, no, they they don't have that quite right, I think. So they should definitely work on that. You somehow feel that this one here is rather thought for the US market at the lower price, where they say, ah, you know, let's throw that to the market at a very good price. People buy that who need a lot of space and were not interested to, you know, look at very much details of the vehicle. You can surely argue for that. But I mean, here on Autogrophil, we talk about all those details that you can really compare your cars and get your best price performance ratio. That's why we also never say this car is bad or this car is good. We always say, you know, like, good or bad for whom and which are the good or, or bad elements. The steering feel, however, has been improved in comparison to the previous generation. That's good. So before that, it was just soft arcade like it was good for parking in and out but it did give, didn't give you any feeling at all now actually it gives a quite decent steering feel so there's not so much of a dead zone that feels a little bit sportier so as for the steering feel you get a little bit better control of the vehicle so overall is it better to drive than the predecessor generation yes it is but I would have expected a little bit more difference. Sometimes when we have those generation changes, there is a little bit... There's, no, that's Tucson. I thought it was the um, previous generation, but that was a Hyundai Tucson. The Tucson is, by the way, definitely better to drive. You somehow feel as the platform would be more suitable to that. And of course, it's a shorter car, so if you want a more agile drive, but still don't want to have so much luggage capacity, or you just don't need it, then the Tucson will also be a good alternative. Now we're near the blind spot monitor. Here, when I set the turning indicator at the same time, I also get an acoustic warning. What about this cruise control? This vehicle here is full spec, so it also has the adaptive cruise control, so the distance to the car in front of me is being kept. And that's also so far well done. I will now also show you an acceleration. Well, we can use the manual shifting here with the shifting lever. We can also change drive mode, for example, to sport. That will turn up the RPMs, RPMs a little bit more. And then we can check more about this acceleration, which is 10.4 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. And let's see here now, like this motor was 70 kilometers to 100. Let's go. So you see, although it's a naturally aspirated engine, we have some displacement left there. So you can also get some decent acceleration still on the motorway, but not as explosive as there would be a turbo. However, I do like the driving experience with naturally aspirated engines. Direct injection, by the way, here, because it's a little bit more harmonious. So those turbos set in at some point, but here, it's actually quite nice to experience that it's rather smooth. However, if you hammer the throttle, you heard it, 
it needs a lot of RPMs to get this thing going overall. But I think it's still good that they offer a naturally aspirated petrol engine for a change. Hardly anyone else does offer that anymore. So now on the motorway, here, by the way, we have a little bit, a little smoother tarmac, so it's a little bit more silent than it was before. You see, this also makes a, um, a big difference. Still, not quite convinced of the noise insulation. I think it's a little bit too loud in here for a 219 car. But overall, the comfort and so the, the feeling the car gives me here on the motorway, that's quite okay. So can't, can't complain too much about that as long as we don't start a too to agile driving, which we will soon do in a roundabout and see how that one plays out. It's always good to compare cars there too. By the way, not doing anything with the brakes or foot at the moment. So now the car is picking up the speed again after the other car left the lane, which is a Jaguar XF. We'll follow that truck just for a second and then get off the motorway. So here we go. That should be a Kia Nero in front of us right there, the blue one. Always, <laughs> you know, when, when you're testing cars, you always check, oh, there's this new car. You've been driven this one like last year or this one like two months ago. <laughs> it's always fun then to, to watch the cars on the road. So now we're getting in this roundabout and take a look at the steering angle and also how the suspension performs. Yeah, I'll get in there. Yeah. Luggage flying all over the place as usual. So then, get out here again and see I don't have to steer too much that was actually quite okay but still also how the feeling on the interior is this car does feel somewhat bulky so sometimes we have vehicles they feel smaller than they are sometimes they feel a little bit bigger than they are in in this case it feels a little bit bigger than it is um, yeah that's just what I feel so um I think it does not really speak for the driving characteristics of this vehicle. Again, it's not bad at all. We just have to rate it to other experience we had so far. Again, with this engine, why not going for the NA petrol engine? So if you're driving long, long, long ways and diesel is also cheaper on long-term run in your country, you might go for a diesel engine right here. Other than that, the petrol will also do just fine. And well, as for the consumption, so so far we can score some 8.5 liters in one kilometers, and that is considering as for the you know being a petrol engine, and also for this segment here, that's actually quite decent. You know, we had recently the same consumption for the Kia Seat, which is a compact hatch with a 1.6 liter turbo. And here, bigger displacement, naturally aspirated. And that's sometimes actually good for the consumption because those bigger NA engines, you can run them some at lower RPMs then as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's actually quite positive. If you really hammer it on the motorway, then you can also get to like 10 liters on more kilometers, which would be 23 MPG, 28 MPG UK. But here at the moment, 8.5 liters. That would be, you know, about like 23 MPG, 20, 28 uh, MPG UK, something in, in that area. I think we can really live with that. So that's a warning again from a car behind us. In this uh, main mirror, by the way, I also see the direction we are going at the moment, southeast. It's quite good to have that, especially when you're off-roading or maybe in some very remote areas. Now getting to some countryside driving, setting the cruise control again. So this is Suzuki Ignis in front of us. That one has a pretty, pretty strange design in the rear, doesn't it? Well, you can say strange, but you can also say unique. <laughs> and let's activate this lane keeping assist once more. See though how that one plays out. Well, there's, by the way, also the button for the central differential lock. We won't need that one today here. This all-wheel drive is very subtle, by the way. You don't feel, um, you know, it, it, it would be acting in a you know, certain way or something. So it's automatically controlled and 
primarily this vehicle is front wheel driven and then if you need, want some more torque at the rear it's also being transported to the rear on demand but um, from the driving feeling it definitely rather conveys it would be a front wheel drive and then at some point when you have like a lot, lot of power to the front wheels and some more gets to the rear that one was actually a Santa Fe in the previous generation. Yeah, you've, you've seen the, um, the front is a little bit different. The front definitely more modernizer here and aligned with the with the all new Hyundai Kona, the very small SUV. Well, one thing not to forget is of course the overview, which is you know, to the rear and to the sides, actually quite decent because unlike other vehicles, they make the windows smaller. All go design focus, design focus, design focus. And here they actually made the windows a little bit larger, especially in the rear. So I have a very good overview of what's happening around me. And that's also good, of course, when you're having a car that is not that small and still wants some control and overview in the city. So well done as for that aspect. Controlling the vehicle while driving, well, I can easily access the AC knobs and so on. And I really like to have that still the classic control not doing anything in the infotainment system and even here this volume button is easily reachable so i think they made the control of this vehicle really easy we can also use the shifting pedals by the way to go down a gear before and then go up a gear again for example um you know if you want to go for some motorway acceleration right there this can actually help but you, you've seen also that it picks up the speed quite fast when you really hammer it when you're using this kick down or you can also use the pedals or this putting the gear lever to the left when you're going downhill for a very long time then when you use the engine brake and let's see how have they sorted shifting up and back here uh, they again they did it that when you push it forward you shift up and when you push it backward you shift down and why do manufacturers do that i mean everyone here in our community agrees that when you use a shifting stick and pull it backward it should shift up and when you push it forward it should shift down i mean didn't they ever look uh, you know watch some rally cars or something i'm not sure why they do it the other way around i think it really makes no sense so I mean, this is some, somewhat a decent drive, but if we really go into the details, we have to say that the driving part is, same as in the predecessor generation, it's not the best part of this vehicle. The best part was really the interior with the flexibility and all the room you have. And now to our conclusion for today with the Hyundai Santa Fe. I think it just makes sense to have just one model, also makes it a little bit easier. Yes, you can still get the old outdated model as for this one in US for example, but it's all about the new model here for sure. On the exterior in the front you see a modern new friendly face aligned with the Hyundai Kona with a smaller model that looks modern and fresh. Other than that, the design is rather a little bit conservative, but that's also quite okay. On the interior, the biggest strength of this vehicle is that we have a lot of room on the inside. We have a lot of space for all of the passengers. Also flexible with the seven-seater option if you want to go for this one. And they upgrade it into the, you know, as for the quality of the materials and also more infotainment features. That's also quite nice to have. Driving-wise, I would have expected a little bit more. The steering feeling is a little bit better. I think noise insulation and also suspension should have been upgraded more if you compare it to the predecessor generation. So driving is not exactly the strength of this vehicle, it does not feel agile, um, it's not super comfortable as for suspension. Seating is still good as for the upright seating position and the room you have of course, that's really the strength of this vehicle and of course the price which is quite decent. If you think about it, you know, in, in Europe between 35 and, um, and 50,000 euros or something, yeah, it can get some, you know, quite expensive than in the top trims, therefore go for a low spec model. But in the US, 25 to 35,000 dollars, yeah, I mean, plus VAT, but still, 
that's even more interesting as for the price. So our friends in the US will have a very, uh, a very good deal if you compare it to the European prices. What do you think? Leave me your comments about this vehicle and please tune in next time to Auto Gefühl.